Hi everyone, today we are going to try to install Windows 98 on an ASRock AM2 Enforce Free Vista. As I completed my benchmarks for this platform and decided to move to another motherboard, I remembered that I've seen somewhere the Windows 98 drivers. I went straight to the manufacturer's website to get them. And to my surprise, they were not there. So I went for the K8 Enforce Free Vista motherboard since it also had the Enforce Free chipset, although it was for the socket 754. I was again surprised that this motherboard was also lacking the Windows 98 drivers and I began to suspect the manufacturer was retiring them and started wondering where my CD was. But before that, I knew that there was another motherboard, the K8 upgrade Enforce Free, that shared the chipset and I was very happy to see the drivers. By this time, I also found my CD with the drivers and sure enough this is where I've seen the Windows 98 drivers. But since these CDs were shared between multiple motherboards, probably this one can be found in the K8 upgrade Enforce Free boxes, so the question remained. Will these drivers work for the AM2 Enforce Free Vista under Windows 98? Let's see the build. We all know that out of the box, Windows 98 supports only a maximum of 512 megabytes of RAM. So I tracked the module, then I picked this wonderful Albatron 4200 Ti because it's very compatible and this will be the go-to card when we install Windows and do the initial configurations. Next we have the sound card, a Sound Blaster Live. And since we're gonna do a bit of overclock, we are also going to have a debug card. Once we have Windows 98 up and stable, the plan is to upgrade the RAM with these OCZ modules and we are going to try to run the last officially supported NVIDIA card, the 6800 Ultra. The motherboard CPU and radiator are assembled and we have a Phenom 2 X4965 under the Thermalrite 120 Ultra. This motherboard only supports DDR2. The hard drive is a Western Digital 250GB, plenty of space for games and benchmarks. And once we get all our tests done, we will look at the competition with the Radeon 9800 XT. We will start with the 4200 Ti, a nice and stable graphics card under Windows 98. We will add the Sound Blaster Live, this is the CT4620 model. The last extension we are going to use is the debug card and hope that we are not going to need it. Let's add the 20 pin connector and the 12 volt 4 pin connector. The IDE cable is next. In order to start the motherboard, we have this switch that's created for open bench setups that connects the two pins for power on. The last component for our stable build will be the 512 megabytes memory module.
and let's start it up. It boots on the first try and into the BIOS we're leaving everything to the default and disable any device that we don't need. The installation is done from a CD and is pretty painless, no errors, no blue screens, no instability. The whole process took about 9 minutes. Once installed, I checked the CD and there was some additional software from which I installed the DirectX package, the installer, the USB drivers and the Visual C redistributables. An interesting addition is the kernel EX that, if I'm not mistaken, allows you to run applications designed for later Windows versions like 2000 or XP. The drivers were also installed, 4403 for the graphics, 472 for the chipset. I decided to do the high memory X trick in order to be able to use more RAM and also have dual channel enabled. This is done by placing the high memx file in the Windows folder and add the reference to the config sys file. This file may not be visible since it's marked as a system file. Once you have this saved, it's time to go into msconfig system ini tab and look for the 386ENH and you have to update the value of the max fizz page to 48000. For me all the other settings are fine. Then you need to navigate to vcache and update the value of max file cache to 65535 and add the entry for chunk size equal to 1024. Credits go to agent X007 from Vogans. I will leave a link in the description. Just be careful that if you need safe mode, high memory X is not going to load and you're going to get lots of errors. Probably you'll need to revert to 500 megabytes of RAM. Now let's swap the stable parts for the latest components that are officially supported by Windows. And out goes the Albatron and in comes the 6800 Ultra. Also the generic 512MB module goes out and two OCZ 1GB modules go in. And here it is. We navigate to the BIOS and let's push the CPU and decrease the latencies for the RAM. Let's see the information about the system. CPU Z reports 4 MHz less for the front side bus in just one core, but the rest of the settings look just right and the memory tab shows the full 2 GB.
WCPU shows the real frequency, but the processor isn't exactly what we have in the system. It also shows the 1150 MB of available RAM, just as Agent X007 said in his post. Crystal CPU gets the processor's name right, but misses on the frequency. Finally, we go to Everest, and this one gets everything right. There were no issues with the other programs, we just need to remember that they were designed for Windows 98 and this CPU was available on the market in quarter 3 2009. Let's switch to the benchmarks and the Windows 9X version of SuperPi manages to be 1.7 seconds slower than the Windows XP version. The Pentium 2s are just blown away by the decade younger CPU with 10 times the frequency. Still, Sandro99 considers this CPU a bit slow and recommends upgrading to a 586. It's funny that with almost 10 times the frequency, we don't get 10 times the score. If the Pentiums would be able to reach 4 GHz, I think they would give the Phantom a run for its money. CPU Mark marks this CPU good for 590 points. This is PC Mark 2002 and we can't really compare it with anything since we haven't run the test in Windows XP. Let's see the CPU Bench 2003 results and then the render time of Cinebench 2003. Finally, we will start with the graphics tests and this is the result of 3 Mark 99. I forgot to start the recording, but fortunately I snapped a picture of the result. Next, we have 3 Mark 2000. In 3D Mark 2001, we get 35,600 points, 1200 less than in Windows XP. Aquamark 3 gets a full 4000 points more than in Windows XP. All these tests were ran in one breath in one hot day. At this point, I was wondering why aren't people talking about Windows 98 like it's the end of the 90s. And after seeing the GPU temperature, I felt that there was room for a minor overclock of the graphics card. As I forgot to mention earlier, it's really important to disable the vertical sync from the drivers. And we started the tests, and seeing the frames per second I felt like I was really on to something. Then it all came crashing down together with the memory of why I left Windows 98 for Windows XP almost 20 years ago. After this error, everything was a mess, and having the extended memory didn't help either. Even the capture card wasn't able to capture the screen centered. For a few moments I feared for the 6800 Ultra. Since there was no way to get back to Windows, I had to reinstall. But I was still under the favorable impression of all the tests done with the overclocked CPU and having no issue from start until the point I decided to overclock the graphics card, so I decided to step it down a bit and try to get to the Pentium 2 frequencies. So I underclocked the front side bus and also set the multiplier to a value of 2 and reduced a bit the voltage to the CPU. That 220 watt reading was still fresh in my memory. CPU Z doesn't get the frequency right this time either, but since we are trying to get as low as possible, this is a favorable reading. Good old Everest shows us the right frequency and we can investigate around for a bit more information.
Let's look at Sandra, and this time we are so close to the Pentium 2, but we get blown away in the multimedia tests. I've never been happier. Cache mem shows some really high values, and I guess we need to further work on the memory timings and the frequency. CPU mark froze 37 and a half points at us. Let's also underclock the graphics card, and we're going to half the frequencies. And here are the results for 3 Mark 99 and 2000. Going for an even slower graphics card, I decided to take the frequencies to the absolute minimum. And this looks familiar. Before attempt number 3, let's get back to the stable hardware build. I have to admit that benchmarking wasn't the only thing I had in mind when I decided to go with Windows 98. I had to have one more look at Internet Explorer as it lost support, and what better way to do this than install this legend. This is Windows 95, OSR 2.5, that's OEM Service Release 2, that includes Internet Explorer 4. I was kind of hoping for version 1, but 4 will do since you get to see this magnificent screen. After all, Windows 98 was quite painless, how bad could 95 be? But I was wrong, absolutely no driver worked. The CPU had to be underclocked to less than 1 GHz, otherwise this error happened. Internet Explorer and some other programs are configured after the install, and due to some weird error, Internet Explorer is never configured properly and version 4 refuses to start, so you have to install 5.5, but in the end Internet Explorer finally installs. But there were other issues, and after losing a couple of days with the network adapter, I finally gave up. I'm very grateful that these components have helped me return more than 20 years into the past, but Windows 95 is just too much or too little for them. I was planning to include a glorious snapshot with Internet Explorer opening a website, but I guess a failure, showing why you shouldn't go full Windows 95 on hardware between 10 to 15 years younger is just as good. And after all, we could always do this, and we're back with the high-spec Windows 98 configuration. And after going through the settings of Internet Explorer, we confirm that it's 5.0. and we start with Microsoft's website. Since this website refuses to render on Internet Explorer 5, let's go with Google, and it all looks well, the only mention is that the page looks like it's the mobile or the tablet version. MSN also works. So I was able to open an earlier browser version than the one we had in Windows 95, so I guess our time travel stops with Windows 98. After all these ups and downs, Let's take advantage of the clean Windows install and try some games. And we start with Return to Castle Wolfenstein, running in 1024 by 768 with all the settings maxed out.
The next game we are going to look at is Star Wars Racer. For this one I couldn't set the resolution, but I tried to increase the graphics settings wherever possible. Wake Free Arena is next, again running in 1024 by 768. One of my favorites from the actual Windows 98 period is Revolt running in 1024 by 768. Delta Force Free Land Warrior was also great back in the day. King Six, gas can, I see him. Roger, take out the pursuit group. We will conclude our game tour with Medal of Honor Allied Assault running in 1024 by 768. My next installation of Windows dealt with using a Radeon card. The regular CPU and memory tests ran fine, and even the 6.2 drivers looked fine, and also the catalyst, with the mention that the temperature got me a bit worried, and I probably need to remove the metal shield from around the GPU. But when it came to actually running 3D applications, the screen would go black, and the application stops, or it gives an error. The last part dealt with the X850 XT, I'm only including the assembly footage as not even the drivers installed for this one. Some people had limited success with this one, but I think they are using the XTPE, the Platinum Edition, which I don't have.
To conclude an already too long video, what started as a curious attempt to see if Windows 98 runs on a motherboard we used for maxing AGP cards turned into building the ultimate Windows 98 machine with officially supported drivers. But I refuse to look at it like that. Probably the ideal Windows 98 machine would be our stable hardware build with the CPU running anywhere between 800 and 1600 MHz, a configuration I never bothered to actually benchmark or even try any games. But we revealed some interesting facts and a list of steps to install Windows 98 for stable environments if you want to go overboard with the components. For me this was also a reminder of how things were 20 years ago and why I never looked back at a retro machine running Windows 98. But I'm not discouraged. My advice if you want to run Windows 98, just decide on the components and run them on stock frequencies and if everything looks fine after the benchmarks in the couple of games, there's a high chance that this computer will remain stable for a while. If the errors start pretty soon after the installation, then you may need to either update the BIOS or the drivers or just reconsider the setup. Otherwise you are going to have a bad experience with this one. Since our setup using this ASRock motherboard showed so much versatility, you'll be able to find more clips about it on our channel. Thank you and see you next time.